Hello and welcome. In the previous video, we talked about the network edge in which we discussed the end devices, how they get connected to various types of access networks, either through the guided transmission medium or unguided transmission medium. Today, we will focus on the network core in which we are going to discuss uh, the concepts of circuit switching, packet switching, and how does the overall internet structure looks like today. So network core is basically a mesh of interconnected routers. So here in this um, uh, figure, you can see different routers of ISPs which are uh, connected to each other. Uh, the major function of the network core is that how these packets from these hosts on the access networks, they get forwarded through the core of the network towards the other side or the user who is connected to the to the um, other side of the network. So there are two important key functions in the network core. The first is called forwarding. We also call it local forwarding. Uh, it is also known as uh, switching. In local forwarding or switching, when a router receives a packet on its input link or input port, the router is going to read the header of this packet, is going to look into the destination address, and then it will decide to which output link it needs to forward this packet to. Now, this is just an example where you can see that the router is receiving a packet whose destination address is 0, 0111, and then it consults the routing table. In the routing table, it has the destination uh, IP addresses. And here you can see that 0, 0111 basically uh, uh, the header value or the destination address is mapped to output link number two or the output port number two. So when the router receives this packet, consults the table and finds out that I need to forward this packet on um, on port number two. So this process of looking up and then forwarding it to port number two is local forwarding or we also call it switching. Now the second important function in the network core by these routers is called routing. Remember, forwarding or switching is a local function, routing is a global function or global action. Routing basically is done through routing algorithms. There are different types of routing algorithms. For instance, uh, there is RIP, um, there is uh, IGRP, IGRP, OSPF, there is a BDP protocol, so there are different routing algorithms. The purpose of the routing algorithm is to decide from the path from source to the destination. Let's try to look at this example to understand the difference between routing and switching. So for instance, you are traveling from San Jose to Northampton. Routing basically means that the path that you are going to select from this source to this des destination, this entire path, is basically called a routing or selecting this entire path is called routing. So you may have multiple routes available. So you can see there is one route available on from this side. There's another route, uh, which is uh, in the gray color. So you basically decide to choose this route. And the reason is because uh, the time that you see on this route is 45 hours and here is 48 hours. So from if you take this route, you will reach um, in shorter time. Same is the case in the routing algorithms. Based on different parameters, it decides which route should be taken by the by the packet uh, so that it can be received on the other side in shorter time. Now, there are different parameters. One of those parameters is the number of hops, means the number of routers in the middle that this packet has to go through. But again, there might be different routing algorithms that uses different parameters to decide which path should be taken or which route should be taken. So going from this point, San Joe's, to this point, Northampton, this process uh, is called routing. However, local forwarding or switching is basically means that at certain points, you may have intersections where you need to decide which exit you have to take. So for example, here um, in this scenario, you have to choose, if you are entering at this point, you will choose that uh, 
the exit that you need to take is this one, for instance. This process is called local forwarding or switching. Let's talk about the packet switching now. So as I discussed that uh, normally the application data is divided into packets and then each packet will have a certain number of bits. So we consider in this scenario, for instance, that we have packets of L bits and then the transmission rate is R bits per second. So the transmission delay that the packet will face is L by R. So if you look at this uh, numerical example, if the length of the packet is 10 kilobits, the transmission capacity or the transmission rate or the bandwidth of the link is 100 megabits per second, then the transmission delay in this scenario, because we're considering only one hop, is going to be 0.1 millisecond, L by R. However, if we consider the, the transmission delay between the source and the destination, then we have to take into account the transmission delay on the second link as well, which in our case, again, it is going to be 0.1 millisecond. So the total transmission delay is going to be 0.2 millisecond from source to the destination, right? Now, you should also know that in packet switching, uh, the routers, they store and then forward the packet, which means that until or unless the router receives all the bits of the packet, it is not going to process this packet or is not going to forward this packet. And it is obviously logical because a packet contains the data, it contains header values, it contains the IP address in the headers. So unless all the bits are arrived, the router basically cannot even process this packet. Now in packet switching, um, there might be an issue of queuing. We also call it the queuing delay. We will talk about delays uh, in, uh, in the next uh, video, but for now queuing basically means that if the router is receiving the packets at a higher rate, then it can actually transmit it on the output link, then the queues will get created uh, uh, on the routers. This is just the same scenario when you go, for example, um, to a bus stop where you can see the people who are waiting in, in the queues, or you go to an office uh, to apply for your license. And if the, uh, if, uh, the person sitting on the desk is not processing the application at the same rate in which the people are arriving, then obviously the queues will start getting. The same thing can happen at the tolls as well. So in this particular scenario, you can see that the link transmission rate from A to the router is 100 megabits per second. However, the transmission link on the, uh, transmission rate on the output link is 1.5 megabits per second. So naturally the packets are arriving at a higher rate than they are being sent onto the output link, and that is when the queues will start getting created uh, on the router. Now, the, the routers, they do not have unlimited memory buffers that they can keep on, uh, you know, uh, taking in the packets. At certain point, there's a possibility that the queue will be full, and the, in other words, the memory or the buffer of the router is full, and now the router cannot take any more packets. So in that case, there is a chance that um, the packets might be lost or dropped by the router. We'll discuss more about how this is actually handled, uh, but for now, you have to consider that this is also another issue in the packet switching where you can have queues and packet loss can also occur. Now, alternative to the packet switching, we have circuit switching, the difference between packet and circuit switching is um, in circuit switching, the resources are pre-allocated or um, allocated to the users in advance. To give you an example of the difference between packet switching and circuit switching, let's consider that there are two restaurants. One restaurant takes reservations, the other restaurant does not take reservations. So the one that take reservations, you can reserve a table in advance before you actually go there. So they are going to reserve that table for you. And once you arrive, you will basically 
get the service uninterrupted and you will have a place to uh, sit down and enjoy your meal. On the other hand, the restaurant which does not take advanced reservations or bookings, you basically can just go in and then if the table is free, you will be serviced. If the table is not free, you will have to wait. That's exactly the difference between packet switching and circuit switching. In circuit switching, the resources are allocated and reserved in advance. However, the disadvantage is that since the resources are reserved, it means that the full capacity of the link cannot be used. So for example, if this link has been divided into you know, four channels and each user can only use one channel, it means if the other three users are not active, then only one channel is being used, the rest of the three are free and the bandwidth is basically being wasted. However, in packet switching, uh, if the bandwidth is free, a user can actually take advantage of the full bandwidth or the full link capacity. However, we discussed that there are other disadvantages like queues can get created in the packet switching. So if you look at this scenario, this user has been assigned channel number two or circuit number two on this link. And then from this router, this router, he is assigned link or circuit number one. Now, usually circuit switching is uh, used in the um, in the uh, telephone systems, in the calling systems, in the PSTNs. Um, but again, you will get dedicated service, but you may not be able to use the full capacity of the link. If the circuit segment is idle, uh, there is no call, then the resources are being actually wasted and the other users cannot use those resources. So like I said, it's normally used in the traditional telephone PSD in networks. Within circuit switching, how this link capacity is actually divided among users, there are two techniques which are used. One is called frequency division multiplexing, and the other one is called time division multiplexing. So in frequency division uh, multiplexing, uh, the channel is actually divided into, uh, you know, frequency channels. Uh, depending on the number of users. So for example, in this example, we can see that the link is divided among four users, which means that if the link capacity is four megabits per second, let's just assume, every user is going to get one megabits per second. If one of the user is inactive, then that uh, bandwidth is going to go wasted. In time division multiplexing, the difference is that the channel is divided into the time slots. So here a user will get or will get a time slot periodically. Every user will get it periodically, but he can transmit the data at the maximum transmission rate. So for example, the user number one, the blue user will use the whole capacity, but only for a fraction of time that is highlighted here. Once his time slot is over, he can no longer transmit the data. Then the next user will use his time slot. If this user is not using this time slot, no one else can actually send data in this time slot. So if the next three users, for example, they're not sending any data, these three slots will go wasted. And then the next time slot will, uh, the, user, uh, the blue user will be able to use the fifth time slot. Uh, in his time. So these are the two techniques which are used in the circuit switching to, to divide the channel among multiple users. Now let's take a look at the um, this example to compare the difference between packet switching and circuit switching. And let's try to understand which one I wouldn't say better, but which one in terms of performance resource utilization is better. So we assume that the link capacity here is one gigabits per second. And we have n number of users. Each user, when he is active, is going to transmit the data at 100 megabits per second. 
And we also assume that the, act, the users are usually active 10% of their time. So the question is that if we have to consider packet switching versus circuit switching, then how many users can be accommodated or can use this network? The answer to the circuit switching is very straightforward. That is because we dedicate the resources and once we dedicate only that, the user can use that particular link capacity, he cannot use the, the other, other channels. So in this example, if you divide one gigabits per second by 100 megabits per second, because that's the, that's the transmission rate at which an active user is sending the data. So we get the answer that we can only accommodate 10 users in this particular scenario. Maximum 10 users can be accommodated if we select circuit switching. However, packet switching scenario is a little bit complicated. So we consider that, let's just say we have 35 users. You can have 100 users, it's up to you, but we're just taking an example that if we consider that we have 35 users, because the user is only active, the users are only active 10% of their time, then the probability that more than 10 users are active at the same time is 0. 0.0004. You can calculate this through binomial distribution. But here we are not going to go into the detail of, of how we get this number 0. 0.004. The point here is that in packet switching, even if you have 35 users, the probability that 10 users will be active at the same time to use the whole link capacity, the probability is very, very less or little. It means that you can actually accommodate more than 35 users. However, in circuit switching, no matter what, we can accommodate maximum 10 users. So does it mean that packet switching is a slam dunk winner? Well, to some extent we can say, and the reason is because it is more efficient. The resources are being utilized better as compared to the, uh, to the circuit switching. It is very simple. There is no need to set up a call or reserve resources. For, uh, for packet switching. So it is really good for bursty data, which means that if the users have data to send at some time, then sometimes they're not sending the data, then of course, packet switching is much better. However, we also discussed that there could be excessive congestion problems, delays, buffer overflows uh, that, that can happen. But there are protocols that can handle uh, this, these issues, and we are going to discuss that in the next chapter. It is also worth mentioning here that we can also get circuit-like behavior in the packet switching, but we are going to discuss it later. Now let's have a look at the internet structure. So we discussed that internet is basically a network of networks where you have so many IP ISPs which are connected to each other. And then they make it possible for one user at sitting on the edge of this network to send his packets or data to a user sitting on the other side of the network. Now, what, what we want to understand is that, that how, how these ISPs, they are connected to each other. What kind of ISPs are there? Um, because these networks, they are usually driven, the ISPs networks I'm talking about, they're usually driven by economics and national policies rather than the performance. So let's have a, a stepwise approach and try to understand how the ISPs, they can get connected to each other. Let's just consider that we have millions of access, which is true, true that we have so many access networks or access ISPs. Again, to remind you, the access network or the access ISP is the one to which the end user is connected. Now the question is, in order to make it possible for a user connected to one access network that he can send his packets or data to any other access network, what are the possibilities? How can we connect these access network? Well, one solution that will come to your mind is that why don't we connect every access network to every other access network. 
kind of a mesh topology, right? However, the problem with this mesh topology is that it's practically not implementable due to the cost involved, the number of links that you will have. So let's just say if you have 10,000 access networks or access ISPs, then basically every ISP has to get connected to every other, uh, you know, access ISP or network. The formula to calculate this is N into, let me just, so the formula to calculate this is N into N minus one divided by two, right? To calculate the number of links that you will need. So just, let's just take an example. If I have 10 access networks, it basically means 10 into nine divide by two, which means that I need to have 45 physical links only for 10 access networks. So imagine if we need it for thousands of access network, how many links do we need? So it doesn't really scale. And uh, this solution is practically, like I said, uh, not not implementable, right? So what is what is the second solution? The second solution that may come to your mind is that why don't we have one global ISP and let all these access networks get connected to this global internet service provider, and then we can have you know connectivity possible for uh, the users sitting anywhere connected to any access network. Well, then the answer to this question is that if one global ISP is possible, then we can also have multiple global ISPs, right? Then it becomes more of a business uh, problem that if there's one giant global ISP, then there will be more competitors who also want to get into this business and make money, right? Because these ISPs, they charge these access ISPs or access networks to use their network and, uh, you know, send and receive data over the internet. So now these multiple global ISPs should also be connected to each other, of course, through internet exchange points or through other peering links, for instance. And then you may also need to have regional networks or regional ISPs, which are connected to these access networks. And then the regional ISPs will also be connected to the global ISPs and then we basically get three levels of ISPs now. On top of that, you will also have content provider networks, which means organizations like Google, for instance, they have their own private networks. Um, and the purpose is to make sure that the contents or the data is provided to the end users uh, faster and provide better service. So this is how the situation now looks like, that you have access networks which are connected to the regional ISPs, and this is basically the internet structure today. So the users are connected to one or more access ISPs. The access ISPs are connected to regional ISPs. The regional ISPs are connected to tier one, or you can call them global ISPs. And then you also have content provider networks like Google, for instance. To give you an example in the context of uh, United States, Tier one or level three ISPs are the one which have global presence. For instance, you have AT&T, you have uh, NTT, you have Sprint, which are basically uh, tier one ISPs. You may have access ISPs, which are smaller ISPs, which have 
presence in certain cities. And then you have regional ISPs that uh, might be present in different states. For example, Verizon uh, can be considered as a regional ISP. Uh, on the internet, you may also find that Verizon is also a tier one ISP. Well, it, you know, the idea here is to understand what are the different levels. So the smaller ISPs are like access ISPs, which have presence in certain cities, for example. And the regional ISPs are that are present in a certain region, different states. And then you have tier one ISPs, which are present, uh, which have presence globally.